be to introduce a journalist and a media analyst, analyst uh, that has followed, you know, this European <coughs> work and the US work with the copyright directive. And this has been a big issue here. So we welcome you, Emanuel Karlsten. Welcome. Great, thank you. So, the world of journalism is uh, not in crisis, but the media houses are. I had an experience last year uh, where I understood three things. Uh, that journalism is always going to be a necessity to a civil society, that it will be paid for by readers, but the purpose must always be very clear. So, I'm a journalist, I'm a columnist, I'm a media analyst, and uh, I write on the things that are overlooked or forgotten by uh, traditional media. Most of the times this means stories on social media. It could also mean uh, uh, things uh, when, uh, or times when politicians or politics are doing things to internet. So last year, in May, I stumbled across this uh, piece of uh, legislation in the European Union called the Copyright Directive. It, uh, um, it, it was weird to me, and I started to research this, and it was a shilling read. It contained especially two articles. Uh, one, uh, Article 11, called, later called the Link Tax, uh, that would, um, or actually suggested, that media houses are losing money. And because of they are losing money, every site, every uh, blog, uh, or every, uh, everyone, pretty much, who, that wants to link to a news story needs to, to pay. Uh, they need to pay to the, to the media house, uh, pretty much. And uh, even Google search needed to pay if they wanted to show a snippet of text from the news story in the Google search results. So this was, of course, weird, because it was threatening the, the, and taxing the very foundation of internet, the hyperlink. And then there was this other article called Article 13, which was later called the Upload Filter, demanding all social media platforms to filter every content uploaded on their platform in search for copyright infringement. If the text, image, video, or audio would contain any copyrighted content, it should be blocked before even published. So I read this and I understood that no other media houses, no other journalists were reporting on this, and it was weird. So I wrote my column on this, and uh, I summarized it like this. How about a filter that reads what you upload, writes and publishes, and instantly removes it if it's illegal? This topic, hardly, because Sweden has already approved it, and EU is about to follow. This blew up online, of course, especially with young readers, uh, because they perhaps more than others understood its implication that this was, in fact, one of the big decisions of our generation. If every piece of content should be stripped of copyrighted information, it would be difficult to ever upload uh, something. Even if it's just recording something from your room, you would have perhaps music in the background or a poster or painting on the wall, which would be a copyrighted uh, infringement, and that would mean that the video could not be uploaded. Other journalists, even uh, EU correspondents that's full-time in the European Parliament covering stories said, well, you're overreacting, this is nothing, this will never be passed, and if it will be passed, it will be a must, much more altered version of it. This is a normal process, pretty much, so don't worry about it. But the internet community, they reacted the opposite way. They put together petitions that gathered hundreds of thousands of signatures to protest against this. Uh, Wikipedia in Poland, Germany and Spain blacked out their sites in protest of the directive. And the members of parliament started receiving so many calls and emails and just reactions that they said they never experienced anything like it on any other single uh, issue or question. Still, media outlets were not reporting on it. And soon, members of parliament started thinking about this. What's, what is this? Could this really be the biggest thing in our term in, in the European Parliament? Is there something else behind this? They started thinking or suggesting or looking for alternate, alternative explanations, thinking perhaps these are just bots. These are not citizens, they are just bots coming to us to kind of manipulate the process. Perhaps Facebook and Google is behind these reactions, and they are not real people. 
and they started saying this publicly, and they said it privately as well. And I know this because I decided to travel to the parliament myself, out of my own pocket, to, to witness and cover the, this vote uh, on the parliament in Strasbourg in France. And I talked to them, and they said this to me as well. They really believed that they were not really citizens. It was just Facebook that kind of manipulated the legislative process. And I was astonished, surprised. It was shocking, pretty much, because, because it, it was citizens that we were talking about, really. So when the vote on the directive was passed on the parliament, the whole parliament actually decided to stand up because they felt they did something good. They had stood up against whoever is, was behind all of this. And I was shocked because it was a complete sh a thunderous applause for, to, to themselves for actually standing up on this. Do we have a clip of that? Oh, we don't have a clip of that. All right, anyway, so there was thunderous applause uh, of, of them just standing up, and, and I, it was weird because if, it was if they had won a victory. Against who? I don't know. So after the vote um, in Parliament, it was only me and one other journalist that actually wanted to talk to the, the leading rapporteur of the directive, Axel Voss. And it was weird because I felt in Sweden that no one was reporting about it, but I just figured that when I came to the parliament, I would see a lot of other reporters being there covering its in-depth story. But it was only me and one other Dutch uh, guy. Uh, oh, here we go with the, the thunderous applause. I had to click again. All right. It was only me and one other Dutch guy trying to interview this guy, uh, this, uh, uh, this rapporteur of the directive. And by me just asking a few questions to him about the directive, about what he has voted on, it became clear that he had no idea of the, the in-depth implications of the directive. And I could do breaking stories that had spread both in my country and in the whole Europe by just being there talking to the politicians. So. The directive had passed, it has not passed completely, they passed into a final trilogue talks and was due to be, have one final vote left before it was uh, supposed to be a law in the, in the countries of the European Union. It was six months later, March 2019, this year. So by now I realized how big support it was. I had a great following, the readers, I had many readers on my story. And I thought, could I go from publishing in traditional media to publish on my own blog, on my own site, and do it free and open for everyone? Could I ask my readers that I felt was more and more depending on my reporting on this story to, to cover my expenses, to, cover, to pay me, really, to travel for the final vote and uh, allow me to, to report on it as open as possible, accessible as possible, under a free and open license, CC BY. So I did that. I decided to create a Kickstarter asking, please help me. I'm going to two days to Strasbourg to cover the final vote. I'm asking for 3,000 euros. Uh, help me fund this trip. And with one hour, it was funded. And I was just astonished, of course. I didn't know what to expect. And I said, OK, I'll, I'll add another day for 1,000 more euros. And it was uh, funded in within minutes. So I thought, OK, so um, double the sum. I'll bring another photographer with me. We'll be two journalists. And we'll also go to a trip to the biggest, um, to the biggest protest demonstration, wherever it is in Europe. And we'll cover it. And we'll do video, uh, photography, text, whatever you want. Uh, and, and we'll just go. And with that, in a day, it was funded as well. OK, I'll, I'll add a translator. He'll be on standby the whole time. And he'll translate everything to English. And within another day, or within the time, it was funded as well. And then I really didn't have anything else to, to fund. So I was just happy with that, right? So I traveled. We went to, uh, to Strasbourg. And uh, we had this, with this tremendous support, this little team. And we actually went before that to, to Berlin to cover this big protest. It was the biggest one in Berlin. Hundreds of thousands of people out on the streets protesting against this uh, directive. And, uh, and of course, we also went to Strasbourg to cover the final vote, which was passed by, by five votes, not amended, by five votes. Only five votes uh, among the 700 uh, members of parliament. And I could tell you a lot of stories about that from being there, and a lot of things that are cumbersome or difficult about that. But that's not the main point. That's not the main point uh, why I'm here today. The main point is how this was showcasing to me how journalism will financially survive. 
that when made clear to readers how their money to support journalism will make a difference, not only for themselves, but for the society, they will have no problem paying for open, accessible journalism. So when I came home, I just said, okay, so this is over, it's passed, but if you want me to keep an eye open, I'll do that as well for how it will be implemented in the European countries the following uh, years. And sure, no problem, they funded that, that as well, so I can just keep an eye open for, for it. And all of this proves to me how bright the future of journalism is. That media houses might collapse, but when something dies, something new will resurrect. So we as a society have a, an important mission to keep good information to the, open to the public so they can be informed, make better decisions. And I know this is not new to Wikipedia. This is how you're funding your whole, the whole process, I guess. But for journalism, this is groundbreaking. And when The Guardian last week announced that they're finally profitable, it was because they asked readers, please help us fund our journalism to keep it accessible, to keep it open. And they're profitable for the first time in decades. And I believe this is the future. To collectively fund good content to be open and free for the benefit of all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And to hand over a token of appreciation, we have uh, Vicky Media Sweden have donated in your name to the UNDP. Wow, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.